Hello and welcome to the Shine the Light On podcast. My name is Eli Brown, founder of Shine the Light On. Shine the Light On was created after I went through a personal struggle with mental health. After I came through the other side of my challenges, I wanted to create something that would be a platform for the youth all around the world to share their story. Each week, we will have a new guest to discuss how mental health has touched their lives. Thank you so much for tuning in. Yeah, and thank you so much for doing this. Um, you know, I, we've been working with Danielle now for about eight, nine months. And then that's how we got together with Cassie and then uh, with you as well. And I just really appreciate you doing this. And I've been doing a lot of research on you. Um, and just, I really love your message and the no hate campaign that you did. I've known a couple other people who did that. And I just, honestly, it's just very impressive that you're doing that because there's a lot of people who just, go through life without really getting behind things that are important to them, or if they do so, it's silent. And it's just really nice to see. And just thank you for just always being so open and honest about, you know, what you're going through and the, and the platforms that you're, you're pushing out to young people. It's amazing. Yeah, no, thank you. I think, uh, I've gotten to know Danielle and Cassie through boot to bullying and, Mm -hmm. and, um, and Cassie is, is the example of somebody that has, been in the entertainment industry for a long time and has really used her platform to push for things that are, you know, anti-bullying and helping kids and, Mm -hmm. um, you know, creating positive content. And, and I really, that's really what I've tried to do, whether it's in front of the camera or behind the camera. Um, I've been really lucky with some of the jobs that I've had as an actor, um, you know, working for Disney and MTV and everything. And, and that's been great. Um, but then on the on the other side, like on the other side of the camera, uh, for the last six years, I've been producing, and um, and I and it's really, I think as an actor, you're you're basically waiting by the phone, uh, asking somebody else to give you permission to do a job. You're like you audition mm-hmm. for a role, you try you try to become a part of somebody else's world, and as mm-hmm. a producer. Um, what I've learned, your own world, we get, you get to create your own. And, and I sort of sat back one day and I said, okay, I'm, I'm producing now I'm finding projects. I'm making those projects happen. What types of projects do I want to, to see in, in the world? Mm -hmm. And I just made the conscious effort to produce content that, uh, leaves an impact on people, a positive impact, Mm -hmm. you know, pushes a certain social message or, or something else to where we can actually pair those, those films with nonprofits and actually like go and talk to kids about bullying or self-esteem or being true to yourself or, you know, anti-discrimination or equal rights or whatever else. And, um, and it's been, it's been a really, really fun journey because the entertainment industry is tough sometimes and Mm -hmm. there's a lot of rejection. And I will say that, um, the producing side and being able to really push these, these projects that, you know, I call them like pro social con uh, projects, like projects with a social message. Um, it's really kept me sane through all this, I think. Yeah, I bet. And, and what may, what kind of got you to that point where you want to make that transition from acting to now being a producer, but then also producing things that have an impact on the world. Um, so there was a very brief time before I moved to LA that I thought that I was go- going to go into politics. Uh, mm-hmm. I've, I've always been fascinated with politics and with how our laws change. And, um, and before I, I moved to, to LA, I spent some time in DC. And so I thought I was going to go into politics. And I quickly learned that uh, I would probably have a bigger impact on the world if I wasn't a politician. And actually Mm -hmm. could tell stories and create things and be an entertainer. Um, As sad as that is, that's my, you know, that's how I feel. And so I I moved to LA um, for acting and I started producing documentaries. I started being fascinated with uh, gathering stories that were real and, and really, you know, making them into movies and then releasing them and having people, basically just educating people about certain things that they didn't know about. Um, Mm -hmm. I would meet interesting people and I would learn about a certain issue. Um, for instance, like I think you can see it behind me, like that's that movie poster in the top, uh, mm-hmm. it's called kidnap for Christ. And for that, for that project, uh, I met this filmmaker that 
was doing a documentary about kids that were being abused in these troubled teen camps. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, this particular film was about three American teenagers that were sent to a reform camp in the Dominican Republic and they were mentally, physically and mentally abused. And I found out about this story and this filmmaker was, was doing, you know, was gathered all this footage and she didn't really know what to do with it. She said, I'm a director. I have all this footage, but like, I'm having a hard time making it into a movie. And I said, wow, this is a story that speaks to me that I think a lot of people don't know about. Let's make it into a movie and release it into the world. And sure enough, we made it into a movie. We released it. And, um, and it's, the movie has actually been used to change laws in certain states to prevent child abuse. And that's just one example. Of, yeah, it's just one example of, of a project that I feel like the project found me. And, mm-hmm. and I just said yes. And I worked my butt off and we made it into a movie. And, and that was the first documentary I had produced. And after that, after I was able to see the change that that film created, um, I started really uh, putting my time towards producing social documentaries about certain social issues. Uh, mm-hmm. And, and then my, my last documentary, I think it's, I'm trying to point on my camera right there. Uh, it's called Lost in Lost America. Lost in America. Yeah. Lost in America. Yeah. And, and that one, for instance, um, that's a, a documentary about, uh, homeless youth in America mm-hmm. and why, uh, youth are, why youth are homeless, what resources are available to them and what it's really like to be a homeless youth in our country, in America today, in arguably the most, the wealthiest, most powerful country in the world. And we still have young people living on our streets. And, and for that film, I was really, um, really honored to have actors, um, and actresses like Rosario Dawson, Halle Berry, Tiffany Haddish. We had John Bon Jovi, um, uh, Jewel, Sanaa Lathan. All these, these actors and actresses came together and talked to us about either spending time on the streets. Uh, Tiffany Haddish, one of the biggest names in the world right now, talked to us about living in her car. Jewel, a Grammy-winning artist, talked mm-hmm. to us about washing her hair in the bathroom of a, of a Wendy's, I think it was, or a gas station before a job interview because she was, she didn't have a place to shower. And, you know, and those are the types of stories that I feel like if, if kids that are going through a hard time see that, then they think, oh man, I can do, I can be, I can be that person. I can get through this or, you know, you know, parents or politicians or whatever, watch the story and they say, oh man, maybe we should actually pay attention to the homeless youth problem in our country and pass laws that'll help these kids. Yeah, it, it's interesting because if I feel like your life has like opened up tenfold by doing these documentaries, because these are some things that I wouldn't even consider just on day to day. But then probably being exposed to it has just opened up your eyes to just a whole new world that's that's out there. It, it really has, because I there's so much news going around nowadays and there's so and especially with technology and Facebook and Instagram and, and Twitter and, you know, Snapchat and TikTok. And we are so inundated with so much information all the time that it's very easy for something to be going on in the world and we don't know about it. And mm-hmm. that's, and so I feel like these films are a way for me to sort of fight back and say, okay, these are things that are going on in our world that are really important that people aren't talking about. Let's release a movie and hopefully, you know, it'll get some people's attention. That's incredible. And it's uh, the first documentary that you mentioned was it, it, interesting to me because I went to a, a treatment program, um, you know, but no, no, no abuse or mental abuse, anything yeah. ever happened there. It was an extremely positive experience and it really turned my life around. Okay. Uh, but it's interesting that, that that happened because there is this blind trust when going into these places mm-hmm. um, of just this place is known to help troubled youth. I'm going to send my kid there. And it fully is just a blind trust sent on a plane. You're picked up at the airport by two people blindfolded, put in a van, driven out to a treatment place. And you're there and you are cut off from the world. I mean, we're in the middle of the desert with no, no way of getting. So, you know, you mentioned that thing and it never occurred to me before that these places could be pretty bad for, for youth, even though they're designed to obviously do that. So like, what was, like, how did this place get discovered? Like, how did that whole, I'm so interested in how yeah. that kind of. 
Well, the, this, you came to this. the story was, was really fascinating. I found out about the camp because I grew up in Colorado and a friend of mine that I met in college in Colorado, before I even thought about moving to Los Angeles, um, he was one of the ones that was sent to this camp. And so mm-hmm. when I moved here, he, you know, I'm living in, in Los Angeles. I had just done, I think it, I had just done a couple TV shows or I had just done a Disney movie. So I was, I was paying my bills as an actor. I was living in an apartment, uh, you know, trying to be a big boy, moved away from home. Uh, and he came to stay with me. He said, Hey Mike, I'm doing this, uh, this interview with this director as sort of a follow-up. Um, because she gathered some footage of this time that I was at this camp when I was sent to this camp when I was younger. And I didn't really think much of it. I said, sure, sure, man. Uh, his name was David. Sure. David, like come stay with me. So he came to stay with me and he had never really opened up about this. This is years later, but when he was 17, he was sent to this camp and he had never really opened up for as long as we had been friends. And one night we're just sitting there and we had a couple shots of tequila and he finally was able to open up about his experience with this camp and what happened to him. And by the end of it, I'm like, oh my gosh, like you're my friend. You're a wonderful person. I can't believe that this happened to you. And, and so I said, let me, let me meet this filmmaker. And I essentially met this filmmaker. Her name's Kate Logan, a wonderful director and producer. Um, But this was her first film. And her story was fascinating because she found out about this camp when she was doing Christian, uh, Christian, uh, I think she was volunteering um, to build homes, like a Habitat for Humanity type thing or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like she, as a Christian, she had gone to volunteer at this place and there was a, a storm or a hurricane or whatever. So they had to evacuate that area. And she actually went to the Dominican Republic. Um, to finish out her volunteering and found out about this camp by meeting some of the staff members. So she was a Christian filmmaker going to a Christian film school and she happened to find out about this camp and she approached this camp and said, Hey, uh, can I, you know, cut to, I think it was a year later. She kept in contact with the staff members and she said, Hey, um, can I do my senior thesis project on all the good that your camp is doing? Because to your point, there are probably a lot of these camps in, in existence that actually do genuinely help kids mm-hmm. and genuinely have the best interest of these kids at heart and, and change lives in a positive way. I'm, there's no doubt that in my mind that those exist. For her, that's what she thought this camp was. So she approached them and said, hey, can I do my senior thesis project on all the good your camp is doing? And they said, yes, you're a Christian filmmaker. You'll make us look good. Sure come live with us. So she got permission to live with them for six weeks. And she sort of kept a video journal of her journey during those six weeks. And the first week she's like, this is great. This is going to be cool. Like, I can't wait to tell this story. The second week she's like, you know what? This isn't what I expected, but I'm going to make the best of it. The third week she's, she said, and she's talking to camera. She said, uh, this isn't, I don't think this is okay. I, I don't think that this camp is helping these kids. I think it's actually abusing these kids. And then the fourth week, she's like, you know what? This, this camp is awful. And I'm going to make it my mission to expose this camp for what they're really doing because I see these kids being abused and nobody's talking about it. And that is what we tried to do with the film. We tried to tell the story, not saying all of these camps are bad, but saying this camp is bad mm-hmm. and there is no oversight. These mostly American teenagers are blindfolded, taken to an airport in a van, taken, flown to the Dominican Republic, taken to this camp and abused. And, and their the communication is cut off with their families as part of the program. Mm-hmm. So nobody yeah, knows. So they're not able, yeah, they're nobody, not able to talk to their parents and say it's wrong that this yeah, is happening to me. And, and nobody knows that. And, and so what, what we try and what we try to do with the film is really not villainize the parents because the parents are spending a lot of money trying to help their kids. They think they're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. And so what we tried to do with the film is we tried to say, Hey, look, you should number one, if you're going to open and run a a camp like this, you should have a license. None of these staff members, they were, they were counselors. They were giving them mental health advice or whatever. They weren't licensed therapists 
at all. Mm -hmm. You have to have a license to open up a nail salon, but you don't have to have a license to run a camp that looks out for these kids. That's bullshit. Sorry. Uh, um, Yeah, no, no. Yeah, yeah. you could swear. But yeah, I mean, it it was interesting to say that because even the program that I went to, um, it was a wilderness program, the first one I went to, and then I went to an aftercare program. And in the wilderness program, um, we would have three st- uh, staff with us each week. And then every other week that, you know, they would change over because all the staff members had lives and they couldn't live in the wilderness with us mm-hmm. for the rest of their lives. And from the very beginning, it was made very clear to us that the three staff members who would be rotating every single week were not licensed therapists, that they were just there to basically keep us safe and have conversations. Now they've been doing this for so many years that they probably mm-hmm. could, you know, pass any test that a therapist would get. But we were told that the very beginning and the therapist come in for two days a week. And that's where we did our one-on-one therapy. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, so I don't know. It's, yeah, it's a, it's a real interesting thing. Cause I know a lot of people who've gone to different treatment programs, some that have changed people a lot, people's lives like it did for me. And then others that it has absolutely ruined them to the point that they're probably on their sixth or seventh treatment program. Uh, with no faith in the system at all that things will get better. Yeah. Yeah. And well, so, and that's a good point. I think that you shouldn't punish everybody for a few bad apples. So Mm -hmm. what we tried to push with the film and what we ended up, um, a few laws that were, were passed in certain states was that these camps should be regulated by child protective services child protective Mm -hmm. services should be able to go in and check on these youth at any time if there is a suspicion of abuse or anything and just make sure that things are okay. Cause I think that that would, you know, for a camp, like what you went through, they would go through, they would say, okay, this is great. Like they're, they're helping these kids. Okay, cool. You know, let's check all the boxes. Let's leave. And then for a camp that possibly might be abusing kids, they would show up, see that abuse and then, you know, shut it down or fire somebody or whatever. And, you know, at least that, that would regulate, uh, you know, p- potentially stop the abuse from happening. Yeah, oh, that'd be a great idea. Because yeah, I've heard some some horror stories out there, and obviously, all these documentaries are created to have change in the world. So, what change did come from doing this documentary? Um, so, in California, a law was passed that all of these camps have to be regulated by Child Protective wow. Services. That was our goal, and then wow. um, that law was taken and mimicked in a few other states. Uh, so they, incredible. Yeah. So we've actually seen a change and more and more states are actually saying, hey, these camps do have to be regulated by Child Protective Services. That's incredible. Yeah. It's honestly it's honestly amazing because there's so many films out there and they just get put out into the world. And I think people talk about them for a little bit, but then nothing really comes from it. And maybe sometimes the goal is for nothing to come of it. But it's absolutely amazing that you guys did this. And there's been some serious change out there. Thank you. you think you guys will do a follow-up documentary with that uh, uh, treatment center? Uh, well, that specific treatment center closed down uh, okay. after after our film came out. So okay, so uh, not that one, but um, I don't know if maybe if, another one. <laughs> yeah, maybe another one. Yeah, yeah. No, that'd be pretty cool. And uh, and you and I, we got introduced to an organization called Buddha Bullying. Yeah. Um, what? brought you to that organization? Because there's so many out there. So like, what really drew you to wanting to be a part of that? So with Buddha Bullying, I thought that their message, um, because I, it was formed, uh, it was formed, I think, the year after I moved to Los Angeles. And it was, I I met Cassie and Dimitri at a time where um, I was looking for an organization to be a part of. Uh, sort of exactly like what Buddha bullying does. So it was just sort of a mm-hmm. right time, right place kind of thing. Um, and the thing I like about them is that they create they create content that they release online, whether it's PSAs or uh, motivational quotes or you know speeches or something like that. So the reach is is much greater than if we had just you know done in person meetings or whatever. Um, we also have ambassadors that go and we'll, they'll talk to schools. They'll talk at assemblies. They'll talk at special events, that sort of thing. So you do get that one-on-one personal con- contact. Mm-hmm. But then we also, you know, film that those sort of things and then release them into the world. So the reach is much greater. Um, so that's that's you know one thing I like about Buddha bullying. And then the other thing is just they they sort of tackle it from a few different angles. They they talk about why bullies actually bully. Uh, why other you know why other kids 
sort of uh, bystanders have just as much of a responsibility to speak up and to stop bullies and to mm-hmm. speak up for people that are being bullied as the person being bullied. You know, the person being bullied is, is going to, you know, hopefully be able to talk to an adult or somebody else that they trust about what's going on and they can fix the situation. But then mm-hmm. everybody else that sees it has a responsibility to stand up. Cause if we all do that, then the bullies lose their power. Yeah. Um, and then, and then lastly, having a sort of a, a rubric or a curriculum, a curriculum for uh, teachers or for parents or for community leaders that, you know, where they see this happening, sort of giving them the talking points and giving them the tools to address it without embarrassing somebody or making the situation worse. Yeah, no, it's absolutely incredible organization. I'm hoping they come up to Canada soon because it's definitely needed up here as well. Oh, yeah, right. You got you Canadians are so nice. You don't need you. Yeah, don't we have are bullies. Pretty, you don't have bullies. <laughs> we are pretty nice. We are pretty nice up here. Um, but was there a time in your life that you went through bullying? Just because I know that um, social media can be pretty dangerous and mm-hmm. a lot of idiots have a lot of things to say and they can be really rude and they can bully. And online bullying is becoming a big thing. And I assume you know, reality TV, then movies, then movie producers, like there's probably been a lot of stuff going on in your life. Like you know, is there something that really like stuck out to you from a personal standpoint of why you wanted to get involved? Yeah. I mean, I have taking, taking virtual bullying, cyber bullying, uh, aside for a second, mm-hmm. I think personally for me in high school, I was the small guy. Um, I was the last of my friends to like get my growth spurt. And, uh, and so I was always the smallest of all my friends. So I was definitely bullied. Uh, in school because of that. And I, I was somebody that, um, I, you know, I played sports, I did wrestling and played hockey and, and, you know, and I really loved sports, but I also did, did theater and I did the arts and I, and so, you know, my, my jock friends would make fun of my theater stuff. My theater friends would make fun of my jo- my sports <laughs> things. And, and so I was always sort of tiptoeing the line right in the middle. Um, mm-hmm. and you know, and I used, I was definitely bullied. So that was one reason why I, uh, gravitated towards the organization, towards Buddha bullying. And then another one is exactly what you said. Um, Cyberbullying is such a huge problem. And mm-hmm. it's not just with kids. It's with adults. People, when, when people don't have to be held accountable for what they say and what they do, and it's not a face-to-face conversation, and they sit behind their keyboards with anonymity, people say the worst things. It brings mm-hmm. out the worst in people sometimes. And it's just... It's disgusting. I'll see there'll be a video of somebody singing and you look at the comments and people are just really rude and just like it, it's it almost makes you especially being a young person is, you know, in this world, being a teenager is hard enough as it is. Yeah. Imagine posting a video of you singing and just being torn apart in the comments. It's just it's disgusting. And, and that was another reason why I said, you know what, joining an organization that sort of combats that and releases positive content and brings people up as a way to sort of balance those, those scales, um, is something that I want to be a part of. Yeah, uh, that's incredible. And yeah, it's been, I've been really trying to focus in on the connection between social media and mental health. Mm -hmm. Um, because I think as social media has grown, people's mental health has declined. The anxiety around posting pictures, the anxiety and the stress, that comes from trying to get as many likes as possible or the perfect photo um, to the point that sometimes when we're taking the photo, we're not actually enjoying the experience that we're in. We're just purely focused on getting the best picture, the best picture possible. Um, And it's something that I I feel like has impacted my life too. And I have tried my best to now, like even when it just comes to Instagram, I just post stuff because I want to post it. And if it gets Mm -hmm. 300 likes, great. If it gets a thousand, great. And if it gets two, whatever, you know, Mm -hmm. and then trying to do my best that when I do see those hateful comments on people's videos or photos to be there for that person, because generally like that singing video that you talked about, it's someone being vulnerable They're, you know, they may not be a professional singer. It's just something that they're passionate about and that they love to do. And they put it out there in the world and just to be torn down. It's just not the world that I, uh, I don't want to be living in or, or be a part of. And I feel like, you know, an organization like Buddha bullying is, is fighting back to stop that. Yeah, no, it really is. And, and I think that exactly what you're saying, I think that people 
that have platforms uh, are are now are noticing that and and really wanting to step up and say, hey, we want to be that positivity. Uh, my mm-hmm. friend, my he's a, he's a new friend, but he's uh, he's becoming a good buddy of mine. His name's Jamie Miller, and as of a couple days ago, he just became a new uh, ambassador for Buddha bullying. And nice. and and he's I mean he's extremely talented. He he can hit high notes, and you know his, his in singing, uh, he can hit notes that I didn't even think human beings could hit. Um, and he's just extremely talented. He's a brand new ambassador, and he, already he's he's like taking the ball and running with it. He's already releasing videos like you can do it and you're great and you're amazing. And, and, and you see his fans, he has a, you know, hundreds of thousands of fans that follow him on Instagram. And you can see all the comments like, thank you so much. I needed to hear this today. You inspire me this and that. And, Mm -hmm. you know, and if, if Buddha bullying is or isn't a reason for people to, to post and to, and to do these things, um, you know, whatever their reason may be, like, I feel like people, that have platforms should be using those platforms mm-hmm. to to push out positivity because like you said there's there's enough negativity we don't need any more of that we need to you know balance the scales yeah and that was one of the things i wanted to actually speak to you about is i feel like with something like this there's going there's no possible way to get rid of the negativity it will always be there but just to put out stuff that's just positive and eventually, I feel like that positivity will outweigh the negative stuff that's out there. I think so, too. I think so, too. Yeah. Yeah, because I feel like we're all at the point where we're sick of all the negative news. And that's why at the beginning of, um, of lockdown and, and COVID, um, I'm probably going to say his name very incorrectly, John Krasinski. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put, put out that YouTube series just about sharing good news. Yeah. And it was actually incredible to me because every single time I turned on the TV, it seemed like something like the world was falling apart every single time. Yeah. And then I would watch his stuff that's filmed at the exact same time where I believe that the world is falling, uh, falling apart. And there's so many amazing things happening in the world. And it kind of did this shift in my mind where it was like, okay, if I want to find the negative news, I can find it. And if I want to find the positive news, I can find that as well. And it's up to me to determine where I spend my time and energy. Yeah, no, absolutely. And my favorite thing about that is that, you know, John Krasinski created his show uh, just sort of as something to do, I think. And then Mm -hmm. you saw all of these other people taking that and copying it and talking about positive stories in their areas. And I would watch for a while there, my routine is I would wake up and I would watch John Krasinski and him talk, you know, talk about the positive news. I would watch some of the the copycats talk about positive news in their communities. Mm -hmm. And then I would watch, and I still do this. I wake up every day and I go on, um, Dodo, the Instagram Dodo page. And I watch those Mm -hmm. like animal rescue videos where, where people go out of their way to like rescue these animals. And that's how I, that's how I start my day. And it just, I wake up and I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to turn on I'm not going to have this negative news impact my day. I'm going to, ha- I'm going to, you know, have my coffee, watch some positive stories and I'm going to go out and like try to be another positive person and help somebody else. And it just, I feel like if we, as a society, if we place value on sharing positivity and we place mm-hmm. value on helping people um, and not even that, I think that there are a lot of people that genuinely ha- have that value in mm-hmm. them. And I feel like we have been, we have been sidetracked by negativity these last couple of years in particular, uh, Mm -hmm. that I think to your point, people are, there's a hunger for, for positive news. There's a hunger to help each other. And, and John Krasinski sort of was just one of the voices that did that. And then you saw it sprout up all over the place. And it was just like, I could tell that people really wanted to be a part of something positive like that. Yeah, well, if you have a direct line into John, please let him know to do a season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think I actually think I read somewhere that they actually got picked up by. Amazing. I'm making this up, but like like a Amazon or a Netflix or something to actually make it a segment of news, um, and and make it an actual show. I hope so. Like, I think yeah. it'd be great if I turn on the TV and there was a news channel that really was just out there just to right? promote good things out there in the world. I think that's How what great. we all need. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would love that. Yeah, and, yeah, and before we close up, um, yep. I just wanted to know, and I don't know if you're able to tell us, what's the next documentary movie that you're working on? Like, what's the next issue that you want to be shining a light on? So it's not a documentary. Um, I've mm-hmm. sort of, after Lost in America, I'm, I'm sort of taking a, a little break from documentaries, mm-hmm. and I'm doing, I'm doing scripted. 
Um, and there's a movie that I produced uh, called Slap Face that I produced and we, and we shot it in upstate New York last October, November, right before the shutdown happened, right before the pandemic. And, um, and I, I'm in the movie. I play this older brother that sort of abuses his younger brother. And this younger brother, um, he, he's a 12-year-old boy played by August Maturo, who uh, people might know him from the Girl Meets World uh, Disney show. Mm-hmm. So, um, so this film, it's a horror film. And it has some scary elements and it has like that, that weird horror film uh, feel to it. But it also is about, at its core, it's about this little boy that's been bullied and abused so much that he becomes friends with this monster that lives in the woods. And, and then all the, you know, this bad stuff starts happening and, and he tries to stop the monster from doing all this bad stuff. But at its core, it's a movie about bullying and about you know, if one person had really taken this boy and, and been kinder to him or given him, you know, a positive influence, things would have been very differently. And so that's sort of where I'm finding myself <clears throat> as a producer is to create, um, projects that, uh, are, are, are commercial and people enjoy, you know, you go to see a movie cause you want that escapism. You want to be sucked into that story. And I, I love making those stories, but also to have, that movie talk about a social issue or something to where when you leave the theater, you think to yourself, Oh man, I may, maybe I'm going to be nicer to somebody or maybe I'm going to volunteer or maybe I'm going to do this. Like that's, I, I didn't really think about that issue this way. And, and this fun movie where I went to, you know, escape and enjoyed it has made me think about something a little bit differently. And that's, you know, and that's what I, that's what I want to do. So slap face, uh, we are just finishing post-production right now. And we're pro- we're hopefully going to sell it in the next couple months, uh, and then we'll either release it in theaters, depending on what the world looks like, or you know, online streaming, that sort of thing. Yeah, and that's honestly amazing that even when you leave the documentary world, that you're still creating work and pieces of art that have messages within them for people to change their lives with. Yeah, yeah, because because why not? It's yeah. it's um that's what we're all doing. There's another film um, that I. I let me point. It's a uh, son of the South and that comes out, mm-hmm. um, executive producer, uh, Spike Lee, executive produced by Spike Lee, um, who won his Oscar for black Klansman. Um, and then it's, it's, uh, his longtime editor, Barry Al- Alexander Brown, uh, directed this movie. And it's essentially about the birth of the civil rights movie in the, de- um, the civil rights movement in the deep South through the eyes of these young college students. And it's a really great movie. Um, I w- I'm in it as an actor. And that one was one that like, I can't wait to c- for it to come out because that's the perfect example of, you know, it has all of the, the fun that makes it a, a movie that people want to see. It has the action, mm-hmm. it has the romance, it has the drama, that sort of thing. But then at its core, especially right now with what's going on in our world, mm-hmm. um, at its core, it's a movie about civil rights and about standing up for what's right. And, and that's one that like, I'm, I'm an actor in that one, but, um, I helped a little bit on the, on the production side. I, you know, I, I did a little bit, so I do have an, an EP credit on that one, but, uh, but that's one that like, I'm just so, so proud of, and I can't wait to be released in the world because that's the prime example of, of a film that I think is going to make people think a different way about civil rights, uh, and maybe help open some people's eyes especially with what's going on in our country right now. That's incredible. And honestly, you should just be so proud of yourself. And I'm sure you hear it from a million people a day, but you really should. And I am very excited for when I turn on to Netflix one day and you, you get your own tap. You, you have your own line. Thank you. Because Thank I, you. No, because honestly, I, I feel like we do need this stuff out there where it's amazing content and movies where you know people are getting that entertainment that they need and what they look for. But they're able to take away something from it because I think you know the world needs it. You know, yeah, now more yeah. than ever. Yeah, you, you and my mom, <laughs> you and my mom <laughs> said it. No, but thank you, thank you. Uh, th- I appreciate you saying that. Oh, my pleasure, and thank you so much for for doing this today. I really appreciate it. We're all big fans of yours, and uh, I'm sure we'll speak soon. All right, Eli. Thank you so much, man. Right. This has been great. Thank you. Take care. Bye.